Hey guys, welcome back. Today we're tackling part two of the interview with Mr. Willem Heinz from the Netherlands. If you stayed around for the first part, part two goes into it in a lot more detail. So let's get to it right away. How did you end up getting from being in the Netherlands and these guys bringing your fish to you saying, okay, I got to go and see this for myself. How did that transpire? <laughs> well, maybe, maybe I've always been a little bit jealous of these German friends of mine who went there <laughs> and they came back with all kinds of stories and of course, and of course the fish. And then uh, the, the, the plan started to grow in my head. I need to go there myself one day, mm -hmm. but how, how do you go about that? I mean, I, I didn't know anyone who went there and I said, well, then at, uh, I think it was in 1989 or something, there was this first international cichlid conference yes. in, uh, in, in Florida. And so I said, oh, I, let, let's go there. And so uh, an, another participant in that conference was my good friend, Don Danko. So I said, okay, Don will see each other in uh, Orlando, Orlando, Florida. And he said, okay, well, if since you are coming over the ocean to the United States or to America, we might as well take a, an extra trip and go to Mexico and visit Juan Miguel Artigas in, in uh, San Luis Potosí. So, yeah, well, not really. <laughs> so, okay, I'll come, I'll come a week early or two weeks early and we'll go to Mexico. And then from there, we'll travel to, uh, to, this, uh, to the ICC in Orlando and take it from there. So we went to Mexico, we visited Juan Miguel in his house. We went to uh, the uh, west coast of Mexico trying to find uh, uh, Maya Hero's beanie, mm -hmm. which was very much unknown at the time. And we brought home a few of them. And then we, uh, Juan Miguel had to stay uh, for work at home. So together with Don Denko, we visited the Rio Panuco and some other rivers there in the neighborhood. Found some more fishes like the first, <clears throat> Herichtis uh, uh, Tepehua that we that we brought home from Poza Rica and from uh, from the Rio Pantepec, and then the funny thing was we had all these fish and I had them in a sporting bag and plastic bags and all that, and I, we had we still had to go to this uh, ICC, so we took the fish on the plane and we brought them all to Orlando, Florida. So there I was with my bags of fish and nowhere to go but to this show. And I asked the people from the ACA, would you allow me to use a couple of your tanks to put my fish in during the conference so I can take them home uh, with me afterwards? Mm -hmm. And they allowed me to do that, which was very kind of them. And then uh, the fish were there. I had to protect them because before I knew it, they would have been sold in the auction oh, yeah. on Sunday, <laughs> <laughs> which I didn't want. So I came home with my first fish. And uh, I know most of them uh, survived. So I kept kept the fish that I collected myself. And then of course, there's always the urge to make a new trip. And we made, in the end, I think 10 or 15 trips to Mexico, most of them with, uh, with Juan Miguel. And uh, then Art Konings also joined us. Uh, so we went all over Mexico on a, on a couple of occasions and I brought home fish. Yeah. Now my first trips were just for collecting. But the thing is, if you go to uh, Mexico and collect fish once a year, you will have too many fish after the first or the second trip. Yes. So I had to decide what am I going to do with the fish of, that I collected two trips ago, because I will be coming home with a new load of fish on my second trip, on my next trip. So I spread all these fish around and I managed to keep my whole stock sort of in balance with all the fish that I kept bringing in, which that was kind of awkward because I had to get rid of fish that I really liked just because I got a new one that I liked even more. <laughs> is, this all, is this all prior to you doing that uh, big giant fish room you called the Cichlidarium? No, 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 that, that, that was only, that was later. That okay. was later. I was still living in uh, this place close to the airport and I had uh, maybe four or five tanks, one in the living room and uh, maybe three or four in the, in the attic and that, that was about it. But when we moved to our house where I'm still living right now, we, uh, we, I had this, uh, I, <laughs> we had a garage, a garage in the, in the house. And I said, well, 
if my car is going to drive outside in the rain and snow, why cannot it sit outside in the rain and the snow when I'm not using it? <laughs> Put it in other words, who needs a garage? Yep. So, okay, when, when yes. we bought, already when we bought the house, I said to the, uh, to the build, building company, I said, well, you, I need you to insulate part of the garage very well so I can keep a temperature of about 25 degrees centigrade all year round. I need, uh, I need water supply, I need uh, electricity and several points so I can uh, mm -hmm. put all these things in. And they did. And at first I put in a, a rack of maybe uh, five or six, no, six or seven fairly small tanks, 100, 150 gallons or so. And then uh, as my, the fish that I collected and got were growing bigger and bigger, I said, well, there's, there's a problem here. How can I keep a fish of 10, 12 inches in a, uh, in a one or two foot tank? That's not, not, yeah. that's not good. I was in getting interested in cichlid welfare at the time, and I wrote a lot about that in, in the Dutch magazine. And I said, well, if I, am, if I want to comment on all people keeping fish the wrong way, the first thing I need to do is keep them the right way myself. Yes. So I said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll need other tanks. At the time, I had a, uh, I think it was a 10 foot tank in the living room. And at some point, my wife said, well, I would like to have a nice little bookcase in our uh, living room because I was getting more and more books and they were lying everywhere and on all rooms, they were lying about on different places. And she said, well, yeah, yeah, I want a bookcase. I said, well, I would like a bookcase, but where are we going to put it? And then she said, well, if you would uh, put, take out the 10-foot uh, the tank, we could put the bookcase in there. I said, well, well, then I won't have a tank in the living room anymore. That's a problem. <laughs> and then she said, well, and then I said, well, okay, I will take the tank out of the living room, but only if you allow me to build some bigger tanks in the garage. That was by then already called the Sichlidarium. Yeah. And, 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 and I said, when I mean big tanks, I mean big tanks. Yeah. And she said, okay, so we did. And I had, had uh, these... Uh, Tanks built in the Cichlidarium, there were uh, two 600 gallon tanks on top of each other, which was a, quite a funny sight. <laughs> and then at the, uh, on the other side, another uh, four or 500 pair of four or 500 gallon tanks. The tank in the living room disappeared. And then I had my really, really big tanks in there. And I could keep big Petunia and, uh, and, and big, big Amphilophus species in there. And also what, by keeping in bigger tanks, doesn't matter what type of fish you keep, you, you'll agree with this. You'll see behaviors that you wouldn't see in smaller environments. You'll see relationships between two pairs breeding in a much bigger tank, the way that the relationships yeah. that they'll have between them. Things that behaviors that no, most hobbyists will never see. Maybe not- No, no that's right. That, 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 was, that, was, that was really my motivation. Another of my motivations to do this, I wanted to see, I, I had seen some natural behavior in Mexico a couple of times. And I said, I, I wanted to see as much of this natural behavior in my tank as I can. Yeah. And then I need space. I need, I need big space. No, no small space and dividers and all that and fish killing each other because I don't believe in aggressive fish. Fish will need a certain amount of physical spacing. And if you cannot provide that physical space, and they'll claim it. And if some other fish enters their physical space, they'll chase it. Mm -hmm. And many people call that aggression, but it's not. It's just defending their own spe uh, physical space. Yep. So I said, oh, okay, I need space. And then I had my space in two 600 gallon tanks, which was really beautiful. And at the same time, uh, we started our trips to, uh, to Nicaragua. Art Konings had good contacts with uh, Kenneth McKay, who has done a lot of publications also. Uh, he, he had some papers in this uh, famous book of mine. So I, I, I had heard of him and I was invited to come to uh, Nicaragua and to study the fish in the crater lakes. So, okay, I'll, I'll come along. So we went there and instead of snorkeling, which I'd done in all the rivers in, uh, in Mexico and uh, on two trips in Belize as well, I needed to go diving because in greater lakes, you'll have to go to greater depth. And I, I needed a diver's license. And I got my diver's license from a police course. My wife was in the police at the time. 
And I said, oh, oh they have diving courses uh, for, for um, police members. I said, okay, I'll hop in. And I, it took me all winter to get uh, some serious lessons in diving, theoretical and practical, and I got my diver's license. So we went to Nicaragua and I said to Ken McKay, I can dive, I can dive because here's my license. And so, well, you can have your license, but I'll have to, you'll have to prove to me that you can really dive without panicking or doing all kinds of things wrong. I said, okay, we'll go on a, on a test dive together. And we did, and I passed this test. And <laughs> then I got to dive in, uh, in crater, lakes, crater lakes like Hiloa and Apoyo and uh, Masaya and all that. And it was really great. And I collected fish from there. So that's where I got my large Amphilophus, my Midas, uh, Chancho and uh, Amarillo and all that. And I needed those 600 gallon tanks to keep these fish in. So that all worked out very well. Yeah. And then at some point we made another, I made four trips to Nicaragua. Uh, the first two were concentrated on the Greater Lakes and, and, uh, and the two large lakes in Nicaragua. And then the, the last two we spent uh, traveling all the way north to Nicaragua to the border with Honduras and to the Mosquito coast. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, were, we wanted to see which cichlids were there in these rivers. And uh, Ken McKay had a scientific station at Gilua and he also had some fish that were collected on earlier trips. And one fish that we saw there, a tiny maybe two inch fish quite elongated, which I thought would be a therops species. And I, by the time I knew that therops is only occurring in Southern Mexico and Guatemala. So I said, well, if there's a therops in Nicaragua, that would be a huge range expansion. And then the opportunity came across that we were able to travel north all the way to uh, the Rio Coco, the border river between Nicaragua and Honduras. And we went to look for this species. I had, pictures of it on, from, from the trip before, but as it happened, I forgot to take these pictures with me when we were going out to look for this species. So I said, well, that's no problem. If the specimen is still here in the, in the scientific station at Giloa, we can take it and, uh, and make another picture and use it on, on our search. But of course the fish was gone, it was disappeared or either thrown away or went to a museum in the States. So we had to done it, do it all by heart. So we went to northern Nicaragua. We spent diving hours at some six or seven different rivers, but we couldn't find this specific therap species. So we were all disappointed. But as soon as we got home, I found, of course, this picture that I had of this fish. And then I found out that maybe, just maybe, this fish wasn't a therap species after all because it was pictured, it was, it was uh, conserved with its mouth wide open. So the lower jaw was pointing yeah. downwards and the upper jaw was uh, extracted. So it looked at it had a little bit of turned down mouth like Therops has. But if you would close this mouth, you would certainly see that the mouth is not uh, pointed downwards, but really terminal like a fish that we had seen in, on many occasions on this trip, and that was just tiny juvenile dovii. So the therap species I wanted to find in northern Nicaragua turned out to be a dovii, which is abundant all over Nicaragua and, and Honduras as well. So <laughs> that was a kind, of a kind of a professional disappointment there. But we had great fun trying to find it. <laughs> Well, you and one of your DVDs, uh, there was a we, we talked briefly about it, but the sympatric relationship that you found between uh, Dovii and Metropolis. But even the more groundbreaking one was that relationship between Nicaraguenses and Dovii. That, yes. that to me was groundbreaking. Where, where the, you know, I'll let you talk about because it, it was your observation. Yeah, well. like, we, have, we had heard about that because in the, well, not in the, uh, the famous book that I read, but in, a, in an earlier paper, Ken McKay had written about this, that Nicaraguenses was supposed to take care of dovii fry in, in, uh, in uh, Giloa. Mm -hmm. And I uh, said, so, well, nobody believed him, he said. Well, and he said, I have some video of it, but uh, if you go uh, like, 20, 25 meters down in uh, Laguna Giloa, it, the water is all green and there's less light. So it, it's very difficult to make video there. And he hadn't used any video lamps 
on his camera while, while he was down there. So it's okay, I'll, I'll give it a try. I had some good lights on my video camera. So I, we went to this place, dove to 25 meters down and lo and behold, I saw a dovii female with Fry and Nicaraguensis male taking care of it. So I shot some video and that was the first video, the really good uh, video of Nicaraguenses and Dovii in, in Chiloa. I remember that, 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 that was groundbreaking to me. It, 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 was, it, it was. It was sensational to watch. It's, uh, I think it's about five or six minutes on the DVD, but I have maybe an hour and a half of this behavior. Now to fast forward from that stage now to where we are today. You haven't kept cichlids. You still have your ponds, though, I'm guessing. You still have your ponds with your uh, sunfish and things like that? Uh, yes. Okay. I've so some long ear sunfish. Yeah. But you haven't kept cichlids for many years. Uh, but nope. uh, you are still so incredibly passionate about cichlids. You started a page on social media where you break down and do these full, full, not necessarily revisions, but you present all the information from starting to end for the hobbyist and you present it in yeah. a very easy to read format. Again, that's uh, my mission of uh, building the bridge between science and the hobby, being speaking the language that the hobbyist understands and still giving him information that he maybe has to read the article twice to understand it fully, but then he, I, I sincerely hope that he has learned something of it. And, uh, and, and that's what I put into my DVDs as well and, and in my presentations uh, that I've been giving all over the world. To trying to, to, to build a bridge. And uh, the thing is, writing articles with a content like this are sometimes difficult to sell. <laughs> For instance, I, I wrote an article uh, recently on the cichlids of Northwestern South America. And I, uh, in fact, I wrote three of them. One of the geology of the area, which is quite interesting because the Rio Atrato, the Western river in Colombia has only been added to the continent of South America 5 million years ago. So cichlids couldn't have been there uh, before that because it was open ocean. Yep. So I wrote an article on the geology Next, I wrote an article on the earlier explorers of the area, like Carl Eigenbahn and uh, Alexander von Humboldt mm -hmm. and Meek and Hildebrand, who went to Panama, which is also part of the area. And then the third one is about the cichlids there and, and the interrelationships between the Andino Acara species and the Cactaya species and the uh, Cronohera species and the Mesohera species. And the problem was that I could not sell my first article on the geology of these of this area. They didn't geology, geology is the literally the most from an ichthyological standpoint or systematic standpoint, evolutionary systematic, that is probably one of the most critical factors because geological formations come up and they literally split areas in half because water yes. generally doesn't run up a mountain. So you know that that splits areas in half, and that is really one of the major triggers for evolutionary change. So then I said, well, okay, if it's social media that is uh, really popular right now, I should be present on social media as well. So I started my own Facebook page, which is uh, really nothing more than uh, publishing pictures of fish every now and again. I, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, telling people what I had for breakfast this morning, like <laughs> Petosi does or did. All right, there you have it from the master himself, a true legend in aquatics, Mr. Willem Himes from the Netherlands. I'm very fortunate to call him my friend. This is, a, this is absolutely the epitome of what, an, what I refer to as armchair ichthyologist. It's a passionate, passionate hobbyist that takes the level of enjoying their fish to the next level and wants to always continuously learn. The guy hasn't even kept cichlids for numerous years now, and he still is just as passionate about them, but he gives all his, all his time and effort into the publications and the work that he does for us. So really, really cool. Make sure you check out his YouTube channel and his, his several Facebook pages. If you guys want to continue the learning process, this guy's got a ton to offer. I'll drop the links down below in the description. And uh, I apologize for being so lengthy and, and if it seems somewhat choppy. Me and William talked for about two hours uh, to the point, And there's a, like an eight or nine hour time difference. It was getting real late at night for him. But uh, I'm very, very thankful to call William my friend. And uh, as always, my friends, till next time, take care.